Hi everybody, we're picking up with connective tissues in our study of histology in your course pack. This information begins on page 45. So let's talk about the structure and how to identify this type of tissue. We will not see an apical surface nor a basement membrane in our connective tissues. Those particular features are classically seen with our epithelial tissue. So just want to remind you that no apical surface, no basement membrane here. Now, all connective tissue has a matrix that may be somewhat visible. I put a star beside that because all of our tissues have some type of matrix. It's just you'll see it really well in some of our connective tissue pictures. Our connective tissues may also have some type of visible fibers that are, that are formed by fibroblast. So let's just remember that blast as a suffix means to form. Okay, so these are um, cells that will grow or form fibers. Let's talk about the matrix in this image. You're looking at a picture of compact bone or osseous tissue. And in this picture, these dark spots here, these are osteocytes. Now, they used to be osteoblast, meaning they used to form the bone that is laid down around them. They were trapped in the matrix that they were building or secreting, and of course, they no longer can do that once they're trapped in, within the walls of that matrix. So they retire and become mature bone cells called osteocytes. These rings that you see surrounding these osteocytes, this is the matrix, and it's made up of calcium salts. So another analogy that I can give to you is this. If you've ever made gelatin, like Jell-O, and you've put, say, fruit cocktail in the Jell-O and let it solidify, once those pieces of fruit are solidified within the Jell-O, it becomes very difficult to remove them without destroying the Jell-O itself. I think of the pieces of fruit cocktail as the cells and the gelatin itself as the matrix. So this is one particular type of connective tissue where you have a very good view of a non-living matrix secreted by the living cells that make up that tissue. Let's talk about the three types of fibers that are common in our connective tissues. In your worksheet, you'll want to take a moment and fill in these blanks. We have collagen or white fibers. Number two, we have elastic or yellow fibers. And number three, we have reticular fibers. So yellow and white are the color that these fibers appear in tissue. But in fact, we normally call them collagen for white fibers and elastic for those yellow fibers. Do note that reticular fibers are actually built from collagen. Collagen fibers are like thick steel cables. They provide support and strength, but they also are somewhat flexible. So in this image, you'll notice a rather thick fiber. I'll outline it here for you. That rather thick, flexible, but strong fiber is a collagen fiber. Now the thinner squiggly fibers, those are elastic fibers. So they're nowhere near the diameter that you see with a collagen fiber. Elastic fibers do, or yellow um, fibers do exactly as they imply. They are going to be the ones that are stretchy. They can re, uh, recoil back to their original shape. Here's another view of some elastic fibers. They do have a squiggly appearance, and that is an important feature of them is that they can recoil back to their shape. So if you're thinking about the elasticity of underwear, you know you not only want it to be able to stretch to begin with, but to snap back into position once it's been stretched. So we really want that feature here with our elastic fibers. This arrow points at a very thin, delicate reticular fiber, and you'll notice it's somewhat branched. This particular reticular fiber is found in a type of tissue called loose areolar connective tissue, and this fiber is actually made up of collagen. So reticular fibers are in fact collagen fibers, but they're thinner and branched, and they form a more delicate supporting uh, network than do collagen fibers. Let's talk about the three cell types. In your worksheet on page 45, you'll want to take a moment to jot down these suffixes. Number one, blast. Number two are clasped. And number three are sites. 
So cells with a suffix of blast means that that particular cell type is growing or forming or making something. So you just have to look at the prefix to figure out what is being grown or formed. An osteoblast would grow or form bone. What about a fibroblast? It would grow or form fibers. Clasts are the types of cells that destroy or break down connective tissue. You know, keep in mind that we recycle a lot of our body parts and rebuild them over a lifetime. In fact, your skeleton may be rebuilt five or six times over your lifetime. So osteoclast, for instance, would be the type of bone destroying cell involved in breaking down bone matrix so that we can rebuild it. Sites are mature cells, so when you see osteocytes, you'll know that those cells are no longer involved in blast activity. They are neither blast nor clast. So sites are what we consider to be mature cells, whether they're osteocytes, leukocytes, chondrocytes, and so forth. Here you can see a picture of a fibroblast. These are commonly seen in our connective tissues. They do take on a somewhat star-shaped appearance, although you can't really see that here. What you can typically see in these tissues is its large nucleus. So fibroblasts are common because they make or grow what? They make or grow fibers, okay? Here you can see osteoclasts shown at the blue arrows. They are much larger cells. The osteoblasts, by contrast, shown at the white arrows are in fact smaller cells. Now, which type of these two cells has as its daily activity to break down or destroy bone matrix? That would be the osteoclasts, okay? That's shown here by the blue arrow. The osteoblast over here by the white arrow, what is their job? It's their job to help build or grow new bone tissue. So all of our connective tissues connect, protect, or support the body in some form or fashion. So when you think about connective tissue, keep that in mind. We are not covering and lining body surfaces as we saw with our epithelial tissues. Instead, here we are connecting, protecting, or supporting, providing structure, one of those types or a combination of those functions. We're going to first talk through six types of fibrous connective tissue. These are called CT proper or connective tissue proper. This includes three loose types of connective tissue and three dense types of connective tissue. The loose and the dense simply describes how tightly packed or how loosely packed that tissue appears under a microscope. We will also talk about cartilage, compact bone, and blood, but we'll cover these six types first. You'll need to travel over with me to page 46 of your course pack. And let's first talk about our loose connective tissue types. We have three specific types here, loose areolar, loose adipose, and loose reticular connective tissue. Let's first talk about loose areolar connective tissue. It's formed of fibroblasts, which help to grow and make fibers. In fact, all three fiber types are found here in loose areolar connective tissue. Now in this picture, you can easily see collagen fibers, which are thicker. They look kind of uh, smeared in the background here. There's one right there. The collagen fibers provide support, but flexible strength. I kind of think of them as steel cables. They have some very strong support, but a degree of flexibility. These very thin things that look like hair fibers are in fact elastic fibers. Every now and again, you'll see them squiggle up on us like you do right there. Now, I just mentioned that areolar connective tissue does contain all three fiber types. The catch is this. They have to use a special dye in order for us to see the reticular fibers. So if you're looking for them in this picture, you will not see those reticular fibers. You'll only see the squiggly elastic fibers and the thicker collagen fibers. What you will see instead are lots of nuclei in the background. They are, of course, fibroblast nuclei. Okay, they do have a star-shaped appearance, but that is difficult to see. What instead you'll see would be that nucleus showing up. All right, so just to review, loose areolar connective tissue has three fiber types. You can easily see two. You can see the collagen fibers. You can see the elastic fibers. The one you cannot see here because of the staining issue is a reticular fiber. But just know they're here. They just don't show up in this particular uh, picture because they don't have a particular stain applied to them. 
This particular tissue is great for binding and packaging. It helps to bind, say, skin to underlying muscle tissue as fascia. So you may have heard of fascia before. If you've ever worked with raw chicken meat and tried to remove some of the shiny uh, tissue that you see on, say, chicken breast, that would be the fascia. It's very, very tight, very hard, and difficult to remove. In fact, it looks like spider webs here in this picture, and when you're trying to remove skin from underlying muscle to the naked eye, it also looks like spider webs. So this particular tissue, because it is a binding and packaging material, is found in the uh, deep areas of the skin, binding skin to muscle. It also binds and packages around our organs. All right, so the general type of tissue you see here is called connective tissue. The specific type is loose areolar. What three fiber types are found here? Elastic, collagen, and reticular. And of course, the one not to show up in this picture is reticular. Another great view of this uh, particular tissue type. Now, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that all the fibers run in just random directions. That provides support and strength no matter what direction this particular tissue is pulled. If you're pulled in any direction, there are fibers that crisscross and provide a network and prevent this particular tissue from tearing and straining as we pull, say, skin from underlying muscle. So it would be a bad deal for us if our skin easily separated from muscle tissue, right? That's why this tissue is known as a binding and packaging material. Another great view here, lots of collagen fibers. They are the thicker ones in the background, like this one here, and the thinner fibers are those elastic fibers. What are these dark spots? They are nuclei for what cell type? For a fibroblast. All right, so what do fibroblasts do for a living? They grow fibers such as these elastic and collagen fibers. Let's talk about our second loose tissue type. This one is called loose adipose connective tissue. It is called loose adipose because it is in fact loosely organized. It's not a tightly packed tissue. This one is fat tissue. So what's your first impression? What do you see when you look at this adipose tissue right between these areas here? I've had students say this looks like cotton balls or I've had them say it looks like soap bubbles. So whatever you think this looks like, those are adipocyte or fat cells. It is their job to store fat. So triglycerides, you may recall, are the way that we store fat. These cells can grow as large as needed to store as much fat as we can put in there. You'll also see some nuclei. They're kind of squeezed off to the side. Okay, so you'll see some of those around here. And the, the white stuff inside, that's actually a type of fat that we store in there. So this is how we store our extra energy in our bodies in this fatty tissue. You'll notice that there are collagen and elastic fibers here, but they're difficult to see because they are weaving between the cells. The collagen provides support and flexible strength. The elastic fibers provide the stretchiness needed for this tissue. So you'll notice that this particular tissue provides insulation. It can serve as white fat, which is most of the body. In babies, it can be serving as brown fat between the shoulder blades. Now, babies, of course, have an unreliable uh, nutrition supply, so they may live off that brown fat while they are getting adjusted to mom's milk. So locations for this tissue, we find it in the hypodermis, which is the lower part of the skin. We also find it wrapping around the organs in the abdominopelvic cavity and thoracic cavity. It's also found in breast tissue, in the hips, um, in the buttocks. So subcutaneous is, is a really common location for this fatty tissue. This is another great look at adipose tissue. You'll notice these large cells are adipocytes. These dark spots over here, these are the nucleus of those adipocytes. Like I mentioned, it is difficult to see the fibers that are weaving between these cells. This here happens to be a blood vessel because this is a highly vascularized tissue. There has to be blood bringing in triglycerides to drop them off for storage. So if you are losing weight, then that blood vessel will carry triglycerides away from that fatty tissue so you can transform it into glucose. 
The last of our three types of loose connective tissue is loose reticular connective tissue. The name has a great hidden clue. It is a loosely organized tissue and it has reticular fibers. These are thin branching reticular fibers that you can see here. They are made of collagen, but they're more delicate and branched, unlike regular collagen fibers. This type of tissue only contains reticular fibers, no other type, no collagen, no elastic, and it forms a soft tissue skeleton in some of our soft organs. So you think about the liver, the lymph nodes, bone marrow, spleen, and kidneys. These soft organs need some type of uh, skeleton, you might think about it, to help provide a type of framework. So whereas the cytoskeleton forms a flexible framework or internal skeleton for a cell, loose reticular connective tissue forms a soft tissue skeleton for our tissues. This is a lower magnification picture. I've had people say this looks like cherries or grapevines or rose bushes. All of these very common cells that you see here are fibroblast. And what type of fiber is made by the fibroblast here? That would be reticular fiber. So you can see some of those reticular fibers traveling through the background here. This white space is the reason we call this a loose connective tissue. It is not a tightly packed type of connective tissue. Let's talk for a moment about our dense connective tissue types. We have three dense types, dense regular, dense irregular, and dense elastic. Now, these three types are called dense because they are tightly packed connective tissue with very little visible white space in the background. This particular one, dense regular connective tissue, has fibers running in the same direction. These are all collagen fibers that you see running here in the same direction. And the dark spots every so often, those are going to be the nucleus of a fibroblast. So what is the function of collagen? Is it meant to be elastic and stretchy, or is it meant to be strong and supportive with some flexible strength? This is the type of uh, fiber that is strong and supportive. It has some flexibility, but not the elasticity or stretchiness of elastic fibers. Notice that the fibers here all run in one direction. That means it provides the greatest support in this vertical direction. If the pull or stretch comes in the opposite direction, this will fail because that's not the way this tissue is built to, to provide support and strength. You'll notice that this tissue forms tendons and ligaments. Tendons hold muscles to bone. What do ligaments join together? They jo join bone to bone. And also a term in your worksheet called an aponeurosis that joins muscle to muscle or even muscle to bone. You have a very commonly known one on the scalp that connects your frontalis muscle of your forehead to the occipitalis muscle on the back of your head. So, like I said, this particular fiber uh, direction here provides strength only in one direction, and that's why tendons and ligaments are oriented the way they are in our joints to provide that kind of strength. All right, so you probably know the routine now. If dense regular connective tissue has fibers running in the same direction, dense irregular connective tissue has fibers running how? In all sorts of directions. So I often think this looks like a pork chop. You see fibers running all over the place, but don't confuse this with the pork chop. It's not muscle tissue. This is connective tissue. In fact, these are collagen fibers running in all sorts of different directions. Every now and again, you do spot a fibroblast nucleus, and this one is commonly found in the dermis of the skin. And again, because we have fibers running in all sorts of different directions, no matter how you pull or tug on this tissue, there is support provided from these multi-directional collagen fibers. So dermis of the skin is a great location for the, this uh, dense irregular connective tissue. It's also found in the fibrous capsules of our joints. They need to be strong and sturdy and be able to handle what we uh, give to them. Just another view of collagen fibers running in all sorts of different directions. Notice these dark spots all are fibroblast nuclei. So you've seen this picture before. The topmost type of tissue up here is generically called epithelial tissue. 
And if you've been studying those tissues, you'll be able to tell me the specific name of this one. This one is called stratified what? Squamous. Okay, multiple layers forming the epidermis of the skin. Everything from this point down to the bottom is our connective tissue. It is dense, irregular connective tissue. And of course, this is the dermis of the skin. Now, because this tissue happens to be tightly packed, it doesn't heal very quickly. Some of our connective tissues don't have a good vascular supply. This one does have a blood supply to it, but because it's so tightly packed, if it's torn or damaged, it doesn't heal very well. If you've ever had stretch marks or scar tissue form, then you may have experienced some of that uh, poor healing quality of this dense, irregular connective tissue. Just another view of these multi-directional collagen fibers. And our last type of connective tissue is called dense elastic connective tissue. And I think the name gives a good clue to you. This one has a lot of elastic fibers. There are no reticular fibers here. There are no collagen fibers here, just stretchy elastic fibers. They give themselves away because they take on a squiggly appearance that you can see here. So there are some tissues that need the ability to stretch and to recoil. That recoil is just as important as being able to stretch in the first place. So you'll notice on the worksheet, the function here is to be able to stretch without deformation. That means you don't need to necessarily change the shape. You just need to be able to stretch and recoil back. Where you find this is where there needs to be a great deal of stretch and recoil. That includes in the intervertebral discs of your back. Your vocal cords need to be able to stretch and recoil, as well as the wall of your aorta, which is a the largest artery you have in the body. It has to withstand high pressure as blood pulsates through. So keep in mind, dense elastic connective tissue needs to be in stretchy locations that need to recoil back to that original shape. So that concludes our fibrous connective tissue types. If you'll turn over to the next page, that is 47 with me, we will then cover five more types of connective tissue, but these do not fall under the connective tissue proper category. In fact, here we have three types of cartilage, hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage. Now, I should tell you in general that cartilage is ha is, includes collagen fibers, it also includes chondroblast and chondrocytes. So what do chondroblast do for a living? They grow or form new cartilage and chondrocytes. They are mature cartilage cells. So let's tackle the most common type of cartilage first. It's called hyaline cartilage. And it has a smooth glassy appearance to it. Very pretty picture here. I'm going to draw off the cartilage. So what you're looking at is a very smooth background, and I sometimes refer to this as eyeball soup. You'll notice these chondrocytes here. You can spot them by their nucleus, like right there, and they are all trapped in little tiny air pockets. The air pocket here is called a lacuna. So let's pick on one that's not labeled. Down here is a air pocket. That is a lacuna, and inside there's the uh, nucleus of a chondrocyte. So we have some lightweightedness, you might say, to this tissue because of the fact that there are air pockets here with those chondrocytes on the inside. So this common type of cartilage is found in many locations in the body, including the nose, the rings of the trachea, the bronchi, the cartilage that uh, connects your ribs to your sternum, that's called costal cartilage, the larynx, the ends of the long bones, such as between your, um, in your elbow joint, for instance, your shoulder joint, and also an embryonic skeleton. That's a skeleton of a fetus that is not yet born. So this type of tissue is great for providing flexible support, reduces friction between bony surfaces, but it's not terribly uh, flexible. So if you compare for just a moment the flexibility of your nose to the flexibility of your ear, you'll notice that your ear is far more flexible than the tip of your nose. So this cartilage is meant to be a rubbery skeletal element with some flexibility, but not a great deal of flexibility. Here in this picture, you can see those collagen fibers in the background. I'll circle one of these for you. 
There's lots of them here you can spot in the background. The air pocket here is called what? That's called a lacuna. And the nucleus inside belongs to what kind of cell? A chondrocyte. Okay, that's a mature cell. There are chondroblasts in this tissue type. It is their job to grow and replace this tissue. But this is an avascular tissue, meaning it lacks a direct blood supply. So any damage done here to cartilage is not replaced very quickly with new cartilage. It's a very slow to heal type of tissue because it is avascular. Great picture here. You notice there's epithelial tissue over here. There's connective tissue here. And starting about here, we see the hyaline cartilage. Some of these cells along this side are chondroblast because they, of course, grow from the edge of the cartilage. And these mature cells over here are chondrocytes. And what is their air pocket called? It's called a lacuna, literally a little lake of air. What type of fiber should we expect to find in the matrix here? We should expect to find collagen fibers, strong but flexible support. Another great view of hyaline cartilage, notice the smooth glassy background here. Um, you'll notice great picture of a lacuna right there. And these are chondrocyte nuclei that you can see inside each little air pocket. So the matrix of a um, cartilage tissue is a rubbery matrix. It is meant to provide flexible support. So more great pictures here of hyaline cartilage. Let's now turn our attention to fibrocartilage. Like the name implies, there are visible fibers in the matrix, like you see here. So you can actually see lots of collagen fibers. They are wavy here. Don't confuse them with elastic fibers. Elastic fibers tend to be um, thinner and more squiggly. These collagen fibers are thicker and here they appear wavy. In fact, there are so many collagen fibers here that you notice there are far less chondrocytes. This is a more densely packed type of uh, cartilage. You'll notice a chondrocyte and a lacuna over here. There's the nucleus of that chondrocyte. There just tends to be far less of them here. Now, this type of cartilage is found in areas where we have a need for some uh, very strong, very tough cartilage. You'll notice in your sheep, they are found in the intervertebral discs of your back, the pubic symphysis between the pubic bones, and the menisci of the knee. So what do you always hear older people complain about? What tends to fail first? Their knees and their back, right? Well, the cartilage tends to wear out over time, and because it is avascular, it does not heal very quickly. So we find fiber cartilage in the joint of the knee and the intervertebral discs of the back. Another great view here, what you see are waves of collagen fibers. Okay, and then you see these chondrocytes embedded in little lakes. They are called what? They're called lacuna. The last type of cartilage is elastic cartilage. As its name implies, it does have some flexibility and, of course, elastic fibers. So we are looking specifically at this tissue that runs right through here. And here you see lots of very densely packed um, chondrocytes in their lacuna. So I'm going to circle some of those lacuna for you. And the chondrocytes are visible by their nuclei inside. Now there are collagen fibers that you can see running through here. There's also thinner squiggly elastic fibers. This type of tissue is much more flexible than the other two types. If you keep the E straight here, this elastic cartilage, of course, has elastic fibers and it's found in two E locations, the ear and the epiglottis. So a few moments ago, I asked you to feel the flexibility of your ear compared to your nose. The ear has a much greater degree of flexibility thanks to this elastic cartilage. The epiglottis is a flap that covers your trachea when you swallow. If you've ever gotten strangled on some water that's trickled down what we say the wrong pipe, then you have felt that water sit on top of the epiglottis. It will trigger a cough reflex. 
So that epiglottis is also a very flexible type of tissue made up of elastic cartilage. Great image here of elastic cartilage between these two lines. Notice the tightly packed nature of those chondrocytes. All right, so let's talk about the last two types of connective tissue, compact bone and blood. There is also another type of bone that we will discuss later on in the bone chapter, but we'll save that one for then. I think you've probably got enough connective tissues to learn. So you may wonder why these two types of tissues are found here in the connective tissue category. Well, keep in mind the job of connective tissue is to connect, protect, support, and provide structure. So do you think that compact bone fits one of those categories? Definitely, it can provide protection. It can also provide support and structure for your body. And blood also connects our body parts together by taking items from one place to another. It protects us as well. So for this reason, we tend to ca uh, categorize compact bone and blood in this connective tissue category. Let's talk about compact bone first. It is often called osseous tissue. This one's very easy to spot because it's made up of rings of calcium salts. We talked about them earlier. They form the matrix of this compact bone tissue. The matrix was once laid down by osteoblast, which are these bone forming cells that you can see embedded in here. And of course they got stuck in the matrix that they were making. So they retired and they formed osteocytes. So in fact, those are osteocytes that are now embedded and trapped in that matrix. These rings that you see here have a name. We'll talk about them later on, but they are made up of calcium salts and they form the matrix of this uh, tissue type. This is a highly vascularized type of tissue. This opening here is home to either a blood vessel or a nerve that travels through and brings nutri uh, nutrients to this tissue. So we know that bone is an important type of connective tissue. It provides the structure and support for our bodies. It's also a location where we make new blood cells. That process is called hematopoiesis. You'll notice it there under the function on your uh, worksheet. Just a low magnification of bone. You can see a set of rings here around a blood vessel, another set of rings, another set of rings, and all these little tiny dark spots are osteocytes. They are, of course, mature bone cells that are trapped in that matrix of calcium salts. We'll talk in more detail about the role of osteoblast, clast, and sites in the bone chapter, which is about two chapters away. Our last type of connective tissue is blood. And in this image, you can see only the cells found in blood. The liquid plasma is not shown in this picture. So the cells that form blood are considered to be about half of blood's volume. They include red blood cells or erythrocytes and white blood cells, which can be known as uh, leukocytes. You also see little tiny cell fragments here called platelets. Red blood cells are the most common type of blood cell. It is their job to transport oxygen and a little bit of carbon dioxide. And they're of course the reason why blood appears red. You can see in this image a bunch of red blood cells. They're easy to spot as they have no nucleus. White blood cells are far less common and they're easy to spot because they do have a nucleus. There's only four in this picture. And platelets are teeny tiny little cell fragments. They help to clot blood. Again, the plasma is not visible in this picture, but if it was, it makes up around 55% of total blood volume. So in terms of location, blood travels in our blood vessels around our heart, through our um, bodies. And of course, they, uh, the blood transports everything from the good, the bad, and the waste. So nutrients travel here, blood gases, um, hormones, amino acids, acids, there's all sorts of things that travel here in the bloodstream. The blood also helps to regulate your body temperature, a concept known as thermoregulation. And these white blood cells that you can see here with the nucleus, they're involved in protecting us from foreign invaders. So we've covered a lot in the epithelial and connective slideshow, so I'd like to take a moment to do some review. 
All right, so this is a flashback to the epithelial slideshow. Can you tell me the general name and the specific name? Well, this one is an epithelial tissue. And specific name, it is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. Remember, this one looks jumbled, but every cell actually touches that basement membrane. So in fact, it is a simple type of tissue. It is ciliated. You can see these little fuzzy hairs out here on the outer surface. Another one for you. This one provide the general name and the specific type. Well, because it has an apical surface and a basement membrane, we know this one is an epithelial tissue, and specifically, it has many, many layers. It is stratified squamous epithelium. So this one's great as skin. It also lines the inside of your nose, your mouth, esophagus, and on the other end, it lines a female's vagina or the anal canal. All right, so here's a couple of location questions. Where would you find transitional epithelium? Well, we often find it in the urinary system, so I'm just going to put that there as a reminder, although that's not an acceptable answer. It is found in the lining of the ureters and also in the urinary bladder lining. All right, so be sure to include lining because if you simply just say the ureter, there could be multiple places, you know, you might expect different tissues to be found. Lining helps us to know exactly where. How about simple cuboidal epithelial tissue? Where would you find that one? Okay, one place you're going to find that one would be on the surface of an ovary. That'd be a female, of course. Uh, kidney tubules is another great location. And again, it's the lining of those kidney tubules. Okay, a lot of our glands, like sweat glands, oil glands, for instance, are also made up of simple cuboidal epithelium. All right, so I hope you're looking at this every day. Like I've mentioned before, flashcards are a great way to get this to stick.